Good evening, everybody, and uh, it's good to be here, whether or not your favorite football team won, okay? So some of us are Charger fans, and we're really sad right now, so but that's okay. It's, it's okay, because football's temporary, but heaven is eternal, right? I try to remind myself that because I'm a Charger fan, but that's all right. Uh, so I'm glad that we get to be here again. We were just here a few years ago. Maybe some of you came uh, when we were... Uh, in 2018, we were talking about our book, Sharing the Good News with Mormons, and today I'm going to be talking about Is Mormonism Christianity? And using uh, the book that we wrote back in 2013, Bill and I wrote Answering Mormons' Questions. And so um, it, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take chapter one of our book that we wrote, and this first chapter, the chapter was titled, Why Won't You Accept Mormons as Christians? Do You Think We're a Cult? How many have heard that question before? Do you, don't you think that Mormons are Christians? We're Christians too, just like you. And it's a common question, and we find that probably more than any question we get from Latter-day Saints, they do not like the fact that we might not think that they are Christian the same way that we are. And so what we did at the beginning of each of our chapters is we listed questions you can ask back. Because sometimes just learning uh, what they're trying to get across and I think that's something that for a lot of Latter-day Saints, they're not sometimes clear as to what they're upset about. So I like to ask questions. These are some of the questions I might ask. Would you please define the meaning of Christian? Right? Well, what do you think they'll say on that? Well, a lot of them will say, uh, well, we're Christians because Jesus is our Savior. He's in our church's name. And they'll give you reasons why. So find out by asking questions. Uh, another one, why does it bother you that a Christian won't accept Mormonism as a part of Christianity? Uh, it seems like almost they need our approval, right? I, I don't know why they need our approval, but they want us to be able to say, uh, yes, you are Christians just like we are, but no, we're not going to be involved in ecumenical movements and, and doing projects together and everything else. I mean, Latter-day Saints are great people. We love Latter-day Saints. What we do is not because of, of our hatred for them, but because we do love them. But we also want to be able to say we want to distinguish ourselves because we don't want to get any confusion as far as somebody thinking that Mormonism is the same as what we believe. A third question, why do you think people assume that your religion is a cult? Now, I do not use the word cult. That's not a nice word, it's a pejorative. And so I do not think you ought to say you're part of a cult. That's, that would be a bad thing. But if they say that, if they bring it up, I'll say, well, why do you think they assume that? Find out what they're going to say. And, uh, and then you can correct any stereotypes. I had one Latter-day Saint say, well, I think that uh, people think that we uh, do uh, special ceremonies in the temple with marriage beds and things like that. I said, no, that's not true. We know that. In fact, one of the things that we try to do at Mormonism Research Ministry is correct any stereotypes. When we go and teach, we want to not uh, introduce Mormonism as a straw man and then burn it up. We want to be able to explain what Mormonism really is. And so what Bill and I do at Mormonism Research Ministry is to give the um, correct ideas of what Mormonism is teaching. Uh, there is a difference in language. Have you ever talked to a Latter-day Saint and you think that by the end of the conversation that perhaps they're Christians just like you are? I mean, sometimes it can be really confusing, especially for people who move here. Uh, how many have moved to Utah from out of state? Most of you have moved out of state. I did as well. I lived in California until 2010, but I've, I've studied Mormonism for many, many years, but I have found that people move here and they don't realize in fact, I was just talking to someone this morning, and they were talking about having moved here three years ago, and they were talking to all their neighbors, and they did not know any better, and they said, it's so great to know all these Christians, until they found out more. And then they realized it's a little different. So there's a difference in language. Humpty Dumpty and Alice in Wonderland, in the classic Alice in Wonderland, said this, when I use a word Humpty Dumpty said in a a uh, rather scornful tone, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. The question is, said Alice, whether you can make, uh, whether you can make words mean so many different things. And so you have to really define the language, define the terms, what is being met. Uh, Sixth President Joseph F. Smith. Now you need to understand Mormonism. If you're not already clear, there's a hierarchy as far as the leadership. We have the top leader is the prophet or the president. He's the top. Right now, Russell M. Nelson, 97 years old, is the top leader of the church. 
He has two counselors, first and second. Those two men, along with the president, are called the first presidency. Those three men are the top leaders. Then there's 12 apostles, and then there are groups called 70s. You're going to see that I'm going to be citing either the general authorities, we call them, or uh, we'll be citing from their, uh, their correlated material. So let me quote from Joseph F. Smith. He says, I contend that the Latter-day Saints are the only good and true Christians that I know anything about in the world. There are a good many people who profess to be Christians, but they are not founded on the foundation that Jesus Christ himself has laid. Now, wouldn't you like more honesty like Joseph F. Smith? Do you get honesty like this, though, from people who say, oh, we don't really think you're like us. We, we actually uh, are Christians and you're not. You don't hear that, but they'll oftentimes, Latter-day Saints, as sincere as they are, will say, we're just like you. You're Christian. We're Christian. And that's where I want to uh, differentiate. And I would say, here's a quote, but a lot of Latter-day Saints aren't going to listen to this because this is not a current leader. And so for a lot of Latter-day Saints, they won't listen to what Joseph F. Smith says. But I appreciate the honesty, even though what he's saying is that my foundation is not the foundation that his church is built on. Uh, 70, Gary J. Coleman. And this is what he said. As a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, you are a Christian and I am too. I am a devout Christian who is exceedingly fortunate to have greater knowledge of the true doctrine of Christ since my conversion to the restored church. These truths define this church, capital C Church, as having the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I now understand the true nature of the Godhead. I have access to additional scripture revelation, and I can partake of the blessings of priesthood authority. Yes, Courtney, we are Christians. In this statement, and this was said at a general conference. General conference happens in April and in October every year. The, the last two years, it hasn't been public. It's been uh, taped uh, from the, uh, this year it was from the conference center. But this is considered to be authoritative. But look at the words that are used here. Doctrine of Christ, restored church, fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ, Godhead, additional scripture and revelation, priesthood authority. There's a lot of terms there. We're going to have to be able to define these. And I just realized, I didn't tell you that you don't have to take notes if you wanted to be able to see this PowerPoint again. I'm going to go backwards just to show you the, the um, uh, uh, let's see, right here. Uh, PDF file with the PowerPoint. I see some of you are scribbling and trying to write. But if you go to mrm.org slash Christianity after we're done here, there is a lot of information here, and I realize it's a fire hose presentation, but if you go to, uh, to that website, uh, Christianity is all you have to remember, and it has the PowerPoints there. And so these quotes are all there as well. So uh, Gary J. Coleman, responding to this girl, Courtney, the daughter of an LDS mission president, who was being teased by her friends at school, who were saying she was not Christian. And he's trying to assure her, yes, you are. But these are a lot of terms that we're going to have to define to be able to better understand what is being meant when, when uh, Coleman says that. So here's a witnessing tip. I want to give you a few witnessing tips throughout tonight. One of the things we want you to do is not just have head knowledge with this, but that you can actually use this information in some kind of a witnessing situation. Because hopefully you realize that this is a mission field. Do you realize that? You live in a mission field, and you've got to be prepared. You have to understand your own faith. You better own your own faith. Uh, that's super important. But we also have to understand what the faith is that's predominant here in this region. And so, uh, so one of the things I think is when you're not sure, when you're talking to a Latter-day Saint, I think it's a, there's something you can do. You can uh, ask a question, and the question is, what do you mean? What do you mean when you say Jesus is your Savior? Because when you talk to a Latter-day Saint, a missionary, and you say, well, do you believe in Jesus? What's he going to say? Of course I do. Jesus Christ in our church's name. And I'll point to their mission badge, missionary badge. It says the Church of Jesus Christ in big letters of Latter-day Saints. So what do you mean when you say Jesus is your Savior? Uh, when you say self, uh, you believe salvation is by grace, what do you mean? I actually have by faith in there. They don't usually say that. Uh, Bill pointed that out to me. But by grace through faith is what we as Christians hold. But they do say that they believe in salvation by grace. So when you say salvation by grace, what do you mean? What, when you say you believe in the restored gospel, what do you mean? 
one of the key parts of this is give them the opportunity to tell you what they believe rather than you tell them what you think they believe. It's a turnoff when you say, oh, if you're a Latter-day Saint, you believe, and you start naming everything, and uh, they say, no, I don't believe that. That's not fair. You don't want people to tell you what you believe. I see this a lot of times. Latter-day Saints will tell me what I believe about the Trinity. Oh, you believe that the Trinity, God the Father, is Jesus, is the Holy Spirit. Have you heard that before? Is that the Trinity? Of course not. That's modalism. Uh, and so we're, we're talking about three persons and one God, the essence of God. We're not talking about the Father who became Jesus, who became the Holy Spirit. So I don't appreciate it when they tell me what they think I believe. I'd rather they ask me, what do you believe about the Trinity? Let me explain that to you. So that would be a witnessing tip. Don't tell the Latter-day Saint what he or she believes and find out by asking them questions. It takes away some of the nervousness because when you tell people, it's almost like you're pointing your finger at them instead of asking a question. Tell me a little bit more about your faith. If you have missionaries come, invite them inside, ask where they came from, why they're doing what they do, learn a little bit about who they are, and then ask questions like this. Let them talk. They'll appreciate that very much. I want to spend the rest of the time talking about a general conference message. Again, a general conference message is when the leaders get up in front of the entire church on a weekend. They just had this um, a few weeks ago in uh, Salt Lake City. And they present these messages from apostles, from the prophet, uh, from the 70s mainly. And there's other people that will speak as well. This was delivered in October of 2012 by Apostle Robert D. Hales. And it was printed in the Ensign Magazine. Today, this year, they changed the name of the magazine to the Liahona, but at that time, it was the Ensign Magazine, pages 90 to 92, and, uh, and so this, this is a very important issue. The May and November issues of the Ensign Magazine include all of the general conference talks, and they're supposed to study the general conference talks to be able to see what their leaders have said. So we're going to get a message right now called Being a More Christian Christian. Robert D. Hales is one of the 12 apostles. He gave this message in an authoritative position. I'll spend the rest of the time, I'll be quoting from Hales in the beginning, and then I'm going to give you quotes from other things, and in the brown area there, you're going to see the citations. I won't always list the citations, but on the brown part on the floor there, you're going to see where they came from. But realize everything I'm saying is given in um, authoritatively. So let's, let's take a look at what Hales said. He said, through the scriptures and the witness of Joseph Smith, we know that God, our Heavenly Father, has a glorified and perfected body of flesh and bone. Now, this would be one quote I hope that you as a Christian would go, what does that mean? A glorified and perfected body of flesh and bone, right? I hope you would be a little bit uh, standoffish on that and say, well, that's not what we believe. Because as Christians, what do we believe? John 4.24, God is... Spirit, and he must be worshipped in spirit and in truth. And so, so here, he's perfected, glorified body. Who is God the Father? He's known as Heavenly Father or Elohim. In Mormonism, Heavenly Father is normally the word that will be used to explain who God the Father is. He was once a righteous human in another realm. Latter-day Saints don't know very much about this other realm. It's confusing because not much information is given. But he lived as a human being in another world, one leader said, uh, years and years ago, that he lived near Sestar Kola. Where that is, we don't quite know. But he died. Can you imagine? Heavenly Father dying, but according to Mormonism, he once was a man who died and then became God of this world. He has a tangible body of flesh and bones. DNC 130 verse 22 contradicts John 4.24. Okay? So we have that. I want to quote to you from the founder of the church, Joseph Smith, and this is what Joseph Smith says. God himself was once as we are now and is an exalted man and sits enthroned in yonder heavens. Problem with that? As evangelical Christians, I hope you do. Uh, we have imagined, he said, these are, by the way, this is said in 1844 in sermons right before he dies. Within a, about a month later, he dies. We have imagined and supposed that God was God from all eternity. I will refute that idea and take away the veil. 
so that you may see. This is what Joseph Smith thought, and LDS leaders have cited these before. So this is not controversial as to him having said these things. But then we have to ask the question, how could such an idea be imagined, as Joseph Smith said, when the standard works, the scriptures, they have four of them. We have the Bible. They have the Bible, the King James Version, as far as it's translated correctly. But they also have the, anybody know? What are the three others? Book of Mormon, Pearl the Great Price, and Doctrine and Covenants. He knows the four scriptures. So those are the four scriptures. When something is said in those four scriptures, it's supposed to be believed, right? And, and so if that's true, let's take a look at three of the four scriptures and see what it says about God. Moroni 8.18 says this, For I know that God is not a partial God, neither a changeable being, but he is unchangeable from all eternity to all eternity. I don't believe the Book of Mormon is true scripture, but I accept Moroni 8.18. Do you? It's true. Now, Joseph Smith wrote this, or he translated it, supposedly, in 1830. He says that, quote, in 1844, he does change his mind as to who God is, the nature of God. But in, in uh, 1830, when this book is published, very clearly God is unchangeable. This is just one. I could show you other quotes from the Book of Mormon. How about the Doctrine and Covenants, section 20, which was written right at the time of the Book of Mormon being published in 1830. It says this, By these things we know there is a God in heaven who is infinite and eternal from everlasting to everlasting, the same unchangeable God, the framer of heaven and earth and all things which are in them. This is in the Doctrine and Covenants, section 20. It does contradict later on. Of course, DNC section 130 does, uh, does contradict saying God has a body of flesh and bone. He came out of being a, a, a man with body of flesh and bone, still has his body and parts, but he, uh, he, he becomes the God of this world after he dies. So DNC 2017, I would say, also contradicts what Mormonism teaches and the Bible teaches. In Psalm 90, verse 2, before the mountains are brought forth, or even thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting thou art God. We believe in eternal God. We believe that there never was a time that God was not God. Okay, this is something that has been around since the Old Testament. And that's from the Old Testament, but even in the New Testament, the idea that God has always existed. So how could that idea uh, that, uh, be imagined? Well, the scriptures certainly don't support what Joseph Smith has to say. Listen to what an apostle says, James Talmadge. He says this in, uh, uh, in, the, in the 20th century, early 20th century. He says, we believe in a God who is himself progressive, whose majesty is intelligence, whose perfection consists in eternal advancement, a being who has attained his exalted state by a path which now his children are permitted to follow, whose glory it is their heritage to share. The church proclaims the eternal truth, as man is, God once was. As God is, man may be. Let me just break this down in two minutes. I'm going to do this really fast, but I want you to understand what he is saying toward the end there, because he's citing from the fifth president of the church, Lorenzo Snow. And in 1840, Lorenzo Snow comes up with this little couplet, and when he tells Joseph Smith, Joseph Smith said that is doctrine. As man is, God once was, as God is, man may be. You have to understand, God once lived on another world. Here's the star Kolob. He had a God whom he worshipped, and that God had a God whom he worshipped. There's an eternal regression of the gods. Uh, matter was uh, uh, etern is eternal. It's ex materia creation, not ex nihilo, is what monotheistic religions such as Judaism and Christianity teach. But that God was righteous enough to become the God of uh, this world. But he has a place called the pre existence or pre mortality, and all spirits were born there, uh, inc including you guys. You were also born there as spirits. And there was a council in heaven, and there was Heavenly Father. Uh, with Jesus, who had created Jesus as the firstborn, and he also created Lucifer. We had to make a choice, and guess which choice you made? Did you choose Jesus or Lucifer? Well, you chose Jesus, of course. That's a good Sunday school answer. We did, because how do we know? We have bodies. One third of our brothers and sisters in the spirit world were cast out of heaven to become the demons and Satan. Lucifer becomes Satan. So here we are. That was pre-mortality, the first estate. We're living on the current estate, second uh, second estate, 
This is mortality. And then our goal is to follow Mormonism, to go to the temple, which will reopen next year. Uh, and, and a lot of people will come to visit that before it does open. And they do special things in there for themselves. They get married for time and eternity. And they also do work on behalf of the dead. And the hope is after you die, hopefully you'll go to paradise rather than spirit prison. And then hopefully you qualified for the top level of heaven, which is called the celestial kingdom. There are three kingdoms of glory. There really isn't a hell in Mormonism, so to speak, but there is this place where you can attain Godhood. And so, as man is, God once was. God was once a human like you and I. He very well may have been a sinner. I've talked to Latter-day Saints, and they, they say, yeah, it's possible that God sinned. Can you imagine that idea of a small God? And that as God is, man may be. The idea that I hope that I can follow in the footsteps of God, that I can be married with my wife, and actually polygamy will be reinstated in the next life according to Mormonism. I'll be able to populate my world, and I'll be able to do the same thing Heavenly Father did. That's what Mormonism teaches. That's what he's saying. He attained his exalted state, by which now his children, you are his children. In fact, if a Latter-day Saint comes up to you and says, brother or sister, He's, not, he's talking about the pre-existence. He's, he's meaning that, literally, we were all brothers and sisters in the pre-existence. We're permitted to follow their, their glory, whose glory it is, their heritage to share. We have the ability to follow in the footsteps of God. It's a little different, isn't it? A lot different. Uh, and then Hales goes on and says, a Christian has faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we've got Jesus here, okay? What does the Latter-day Saint mean when he says Jesus? Jesus is God's firstborn son, and he's humanity's eldest brother. So in the preexistence, he was the first one that was born. Prior to the incarnation, when he came to the earth, he was known as Jehovah. Okay, so this is the idea of who Jesus is. Now, who is Jesus according to Christianity? Well, Jesus is the God-man. He's 100% God, 100% man. We call it the kenosis. Uh, we have verses to support the idea that Jesus was God. How about John 1.1? 1, 1? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. Uh, he created all things, it says in verse 3. Uh, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, verse 14. And I can share lots of verses to support the idea that Jesus has always been God. But here, he's the first created as far as the firstborn goes. This is what Gordon Hinckley, the 15th president of the church, said at a general conference. As a church, we have critics, many of them. They say we do not believe in the traditional Christ of Christianity. There is some substance to what they say. If somebody comes and tells you they believe in a Jesus that is different than the traditional Jesus, beware. Beware very much. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 11.4, it's possible to have a, a, a false view of Jesus. I mean, everybody has Jesus. Have you ever looked at Islam? He's one of the seven greatest prophets. Peace be upon him, the Muslim will say. If you take a look at the Hare Krishna religion, I don't know if you've ever looked into that. Hare Krishna say he's a great guru. They, they uphold Jesus. And you go through a lot of different religions. They do have a place oftentimes for Jesus. But if you have the possibility of a false Jesus, this is not the same Jesus that's being talked about as far as what Christianity says. How about this? He says, um, Hale says, he is the literal son of God. Jesus Christ is his only begotten son of the flesh. Now, if you read that by itself, it sounds pretty Christian. Okay, he's the son of God. He's the, he's the uh, only begotten son. It says that in John 3.16. But what does Mormonism teach about being a literal son of God? This is from the church website from the Ensign Magazine, December of 2008. And 13, our Savior Jesus Christ is called the only begotten Son because he is the only person on earth to be born of a mortal mother and an immortal father. He inherited divine powers from God, his father. From his mother Mary, he inherited mortality and was subject to hunger, thirst, fatigue, pain, and death. Notice, he's born to a mortal mother, Mary, and an immortal father, heavenly father. And this is a literal thing that actually, what, according to Hales, he says, literal son of God. Ezra Taft Benson uh, was the 13th president. He said, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints proclaims that Jesus Christ is the son of God in the most literal sense. 
the body in which he performed his mission in the flesh was sired by that same being, holy being, we worship as God, our eternal Father. Jesus was not the son of Joseph, nor was he begotten by the Holy Ghost. Now, Matthew 1.18 says that Jesus was born through the Holy Ghost. That's what the Bible says. He says, no, that's wrong. He says, it was through the hev- through Heavenly Father, Jesus was created. What is being said? I want to show you from a 1972 Family Home Evening Manual. This manual is used, was used to... Uh, to help parents teach their kids some doctrine because they have, usually on Monday nights, a time for the family to get together. Have you heard of family home evening? It's actually, it's a kind of a cool thing. You get your family together, you play some games, uh, you spend time together as a family. Uh, And uh, I know that there are some school districts who don't give homework on Mondays because of family home evening. And I don't know if that's here or not, but this is what this manual said in 1972 talking to parents to how to teach their children. At this point, discuss your own words how Jesus was the only begotten Son of God. You might do this using the following illustration on a chalkboard or a piece of paper. The illustration, and I don't know if you can see it back there, Daddy plus Mommy equals you, in the same way that our Heavenly Father plus Mary equals Jesus. This is incestuous. Because who is Mary in the pre-existence, in the pre-mortality? Just like us, she was born as a spirit daughter of Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother. And so she's born under this earth, and then there is, he has a physical body with body, parts, and passion. And so uh, there was a transfer, uh, a fatherly transfer to the mother, Mary, to be able to produce Jesus. That is a corruption of the virgin birth. That's not the virgin birth that Christianity teaches this is a different Jesus. 2 Corinthians 11.4, beware of anyone who teaches a, another Jesus. Galatians 1.8.9, beware of anyone who teaches to you a false gospel. You know, because even if an angel of heaven comes and presents to you a gospel other than the one I, uh, what I presented to you, let him be accursed. Paul repeats himself in verse 9. So this is serious stuff. We want to love our Mormon friends and neighbors. We want to be able to, we're not trying to separate ourselves. We're just trying to set a standard that we have different beliefs, and that's okay. We can agree to disagree and still love our Mormon friends and neighbors and our family members. I have family members as well. Some, I know many of you probably do too, who are Latter-day Saints. We want to be able to, uh, to present this, but this is not right. This is not truth, and I want to point that out. Hales goes on and says, To suffer for our sins in the supreme act of love, we know as the atonement. I all the time I'm talking to Latter-day Saints, and they're always talking about the atonement. What is meant by the atonement in Mormonism? It was provided by Jesus suffering in Gethsemane and on the cross. Now, in the old days, they never even used the cross. They would just say Gethsemane. But in, in the last 20 years, we've seen them mentioning it as almost an afterthought, because Jesus did bleed in the Garden of Gethsemane. It allows humankind to have a resurrection, to be able to go to one of what are called three kingdoms of glory, the celestial kingdom, the terrestrial kingdom, or the telestial kingdom. And so you're going to go to one of those three kingdoms of glory based on which law you are abiding by. You have to abide a celestial law and keep all the commandments continually if you hope to go to the top level. But it's the atonement is provided through Gethsemane and on the cross. However, the cross, as it's in the front of your sanctuary, is not something that Latter-day Saints like. They, they, you'll not see Latter-day Saints wearing a cross around their neck. You will uh, not see that on their buildings. But it allows humans to have a resurrection and paves the way for potential exaltation. Exaltation, or eternal life in Mormonism, is equal to being able to become gods in the next life, in the celestial kingdom. And very much so, Latter-day Saints. They may not say it to you directly, but that is what Mormonism teaches. The desire should be to want to become gods in the next life. Okay? True to the Faith, the manual says this. This is an official church manual. Through the atonement, Jesus Christ redeems all people from the effects of the fall, allowing you to have one of the, have one of the three kingdoms of glory. All people who have ever lived on the earth and who will ever live on the earth will be resurrected and brought into the presence of God to be judged. Through the Savior's gift of mercy and redeeming grace, we all receive the gift of immortality and live forever in glorified, resurrected bodies. 
everybody? And the answer is yes, everybody. Even Adolf Hitler in the 1980s, his work in the temple was done in the London temple out of all things. It's kind of ironic because Hitler was not very nice to England, but in the England, the London temple, uh, somebody actually got baptized on his behalf, which is important, and then he was also sealed to his parents. And so even Adolf Hitler will at least get to go to the Telestial Kingdom, and you, if you're a good person, will probably go to the Terrestrial Kingdom, a place where most Latter-day Saints figure they will go when they die. Most Latter-day Saints I talk to know they're not doing everything they're supposed to to get to the Celestial Kingdom, and when I ask them when they're going to start doing it, they don't know because it's a pretty much impossible gospel to keep. And so this is important to understand that Mormons don't believe that you're, not, you're all going to get resurrected to somewhere that's not so bad. There's really not a hell for, um, for people who live here on this earth. Preach My Gospel is a missionary manual. The missionaries study this on how they're supposed to teach. And it says, the Savior satisfied the demands of justice for those who repent of their sins and endeavor to keep all the commandments when he stood in our place and suffered the penalty for our sins. This act is called the atonement. However, Jesus did not eliminate our personal responsibility. He forgives our sins when, and here we have to go through a litany of things we have to do, when we accept him, when we repent, and when we obey his commandments. Through the atonement and living the gospel, we become worthy to enter the presence of our Heavenly Father permanently. Notice, you have to accept him, repent, and you have to obey his commandments. How many commandments do you think they realize they have to keep? Some of them? All of them. How often? All the time. I've run through that many times with Latter-day Saints on the street when I'm witnessing. I'll say, how many commandments do you have to keep? And they know they have to keep all of them. And then they say, I say, how often? All the time. And then I ask the question, so how are you doing at that? And they say, well, I'm doing my best. I'm trying. Uh, and there, there's ways to go with that because the, the, the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenant says trying is not going to do it for you. First Nephi 3, 7 in the Book of Mormon says God does not give commandments that cannot be kept. So if it's possible for you to keep all the commandments, and they all know First Nephi 3, 7, then and they're not doing it, it really bothers them. I was at the BYU football game last week, standing outside the stadium and having lots of conversations. I love going to the football game with BYU, and uh, I can't tell you how many conversations where I would get into that. And, you know, they, they realize, they kind of put their head to the ground, and they realize they're not doing everything that they're supposed to do. And, you know, in Christianity, it's not a bunch of rules and regulations. It's about what Jesus did for me. I don't have to go do everything to try to earn my own salvation. Jesus did everything, and it's through faith and faith alone. So this idea that everybody has that right is certainly a part of Mormonism, to be able to have a resurrection in one of the three kingdoms. He goes on and he says, The Holy Spirit is a personage of spirit whose work is to testify of the Father and the Son. Now, they use either the Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost. Oftentimes, it'll be Holy Ghost. Who is the Holy Ghost? He's a son of God the Father, just like Jesus, just like you and me, daughter or son, as well as a brother of Jesus. This is from Gospel Principles. He, the Holy Ghost, will help us understand that we can become exalted, become gods, like our Heavenly Father. So the idea of the Holy Spirit is different uh, because we think he's the third uh, person of the Trinity and uh, he's our comforter. There's a lot of things about the Holy Spirit, but that is not what the Holy Spirit does, is help us to understand that we can become like God in that sense. As far as the Godhead, uh, the Godhead, uh, Hale says, is three separate and distinct beings united in purpose. Godhead, then, is three gods, not one God. In Christianity, we believe in monotheism. We believe that Deuteronomy 6.4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord is a God. Jesus quotes that in Mark chapter 12. He, he very much, uh, so important, it's said in every Jewish con congregation on the Shabbat, the Sabbath, and, uh, and we as Christians also believe that. Uh, three gods, God the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Ghost, who, while distinct in being, are one in purpose. This is not the Trinity. This is tritheism. Three separate gods of their own right. They are one, not in essence, as Christianity teaches, but one in purpose. 
In our book, Mormonism 101, we have a section there that has a whole, we have a whole chapter on the Trinity, and that's just a small section. You can read whole books on the Trinity. Uh, you can get a systematic theology book. I mean, you can get Wayne Grudem's, or you can get John MacArthur's, or there's other systematic theology books. I think you should have one at your house to be able to read and study theology. And that is not the Trinity. That's what Christianity teaches. Joseph Smith said, I have always declared God to be a distinct personage, Jesus Christ a separate and distinct personage from God the Father, and that the Holy Ghost was a distinct personage in a spirit. And these three constitute three distinct personages and three gods. When that issue of the Trinity comes up, a lot of Christians want to just put their head in the sand and just want the issue to go away. Again, I'm going to suggest you own your own faith. You Obviously, it's a mystery. The, the Trinity is not something we can fully comprehend, but God is incomprehensible. He's above our thoughts. Okay? So, so we can't fully... Gra- I can't understand eternity either. And the Mormon realizes there's mystery because he can't tell you what it was like when God was on his world or what his father was like or even his name. We don't, they don't know. It's a mystery, they would say. Well, we have mystery as well. But the idea that God... Is, um, is three persons and in, 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 in one essence of who God is, is very much a Christian teaching. We believe that. I think you, you can find evidence well before the Council of Nicaea. It wasn't just created at the Council of Nicaea. One of the things I will do when a Mormon brings up the Trinity, do you believe in the Trinity? I like to ask the question, what? What do you mean when you say the Trinity? Can you explain the Trinity to me? And you've done this before, you've t- you, and, and here's what they're going to say. Oh, you believe that God the Father is the Son, is the Holy Ghost. Who was Jesus praying to in the Garden of Gethsemane? In our book, Answering Mormon's Questions, we deal with that very question and uh, explain how you can answer that, because that's a false view. So we're going to have to be able to correct that and help them understand that we don't have a red- heretical view. We have a very traditional, going back to the Bible view. It's the Mormons who have... I believe the heretical view, and it's uh, th- their version is is a, it's the old heresy. It's not like it's a it's something they created, but it's not what the Trinity is. Then Hale says a Christian believes that through the grace of God, the Father and His Son Jesus Christ. So often Latter Day Saints will say, "Of course we believe in the grace of God," and this is where Christians get confused. Well, they believe in the grace of God. I guess they're Christian. What do they mean when they say the grace of God? It's the enabling power to keep the commandments of God. So in essence, it's God providing you with the ability so you can keep the commandments. Enabling power, you can find that all over the place. Go on their website, look up grace, you'll see that that word is used. Uh, This is what the Bible Dictionary says. This grace is an enabling power that allows men and women to lay hold on eternal life and exaltation after they have expended their own best efforts. Divine grace is needed by every soul in consequence of the fall of Adam and also because of man's weaknesses and shortcomings. However, grace cannot suffice without total effort on the part of the recipient. Hence the explanation, it is by grace that we are saved after all we can do. Now, you all hopefully know, I hope you've memorized Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For we are saved by grace through, this is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. Very clearly the Bible teaches, and that's just one of many verses. You go to Titus 3, 5 through 7, and there's other places very clear. Read the book of Romans, read the book of Galatians, very clear as to what that is. According to Mormonism, you're saved by grace, and if there was a period there, I would be okay with it. But there's a comma, after all we can do. So you ask the Latter-day Saint, well, how much can you do? They don't really understand that either. They say, well, you've got to do something. Nothing comes for free. And, uh, and so this is a great discussion because 2 Nephi 25-23, you can go to our website, type in 2 Nephi 25-23 in the search box. You'll find some articles, one that I wrote just a few years ago, and showing how Latter-day Saint leaders have clearly taught it's based not on grace, it's grace plus works. That's not grace alone that Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 is talking about. Okay? Uh, then he says we can repent. Well, what does repent mean in Mormonism? Well, it's the process by which a member receives forgiveness. True repentance involves six steps, including confession, 
and a successful abandonment of sins. This is Mormonism I'm talking about. This is a teaching manual for teachers. How can repentance help us progress? When we repent, we abandon our sins, which keeps us from improving and progressing. According to the scriptures, and by the way, again, you don't tell a Latter-day Saint, well, you know, you believe that uh, you repent, you have to abandon their sins. They don't necessarily believe that. They, they think that they every Sunday, when they take the sacrament, that they can repent of their sins and then it's okay, you've got a clean slate. But you've got to do it next week and the week after and the week after. But that's not what the scripture says. Uh, uh, very much so. Uh, and I'll show you that in just a second. Forgive others, keep the commandments. Well, what does it mean, keep the commandments? Well, these are the laws and rules as taught by the LDS Church. Ezra Taft Benson, the 13th president, said our agreement, when they make a covenant, and they make a covenant at eight years, starting at eight years old at baptism, they make it every Sunday in their sacrament service, they make it at the temple, Every single week they are repenting and making covenants. Our agreement is keeping all the commandments. That's our covenant with God. Only as we do this may we deserve His blessings and merit His mercy. Is mercy to be merited? Mercy is not mercy if it's merited. You don't earn mercy. You receive mercy. You're not getting the just punishment that was due you. Okay? Grace is getting something you didn't deserve. They're related words, but they're a little different meaning there. Mercy is um, not getting what you deserve. You deserve hell, according to Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. Uh, I'm glad there's a comma there, not a period. Right? We're all sinners, Romans 3.23. But the wages of sin is death, comma, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Isn't that great? We, the gospel is good news. Bad news is we're condemned. That, there's bad news of the gospel, and we need to present that. But he says you have to merit his mercy. That is impossible. And then he says you inherit eternal life. Eternal life, according to Mormonism, is exaltation, synonymous with eternal life, in the highest level of the celestial kingdom, the very top kingdom in Mormonism, where they hope to go and live forever with their earthly family. That's what they're striving for. That's what the temple is for. That's what doing all the things they're supposed to do, keeping all the commandments. Uh, a teaching manual says, as we are obedient to the commandments of God, we earn the right to live with him forever in the celestial kingdom. A, it's not a wage, the Bible says. Okay, A wage is something you do when you work, and when you get your paycheck from your boss, and you say, oh, thank you for the gift. No, you earn that. But that's not how salvation works. Salvation is a gift freely received based on what God did for us, not based on anything we did, are doing, or will do. There's a huge difference. Twelfth President Spencer Kimball, I was here a few years ago and I gave you the Miracle of Forgiveness presentation. I don't know if some of you were here for that, but i got to quote this because it's, it's really powerful. Spencer Kimball wrote a book in 1969 called The Miracle of Forgiveness, uh, as we like to say, there's really not a miracle in here, and there's no forgiveness, because it's an impossible gospel. Listen to what he says. Eternal life hangs in the balance, awaiting the works of men. Not what Jesus did. See, Jesus imputed his righteousness and put it into your account, not again on a wage, but as a gift. Awaiting the works of men. This progress toward eternal life is a matter of achieving perfection. Living all the commandments guarantees total forgiveness and assures one of exaltation. Incomplete repentance never brought complete forgiveness. He goes on and says, Your Heavenly Father has promised forgiveness upon total repentance and meeting some of the requirements. Some, it's not some of the requirements, but all the requirements. But that forgiveness is not granted merely for the asking. Wow. There must be works, many works, and an all-out total surrender with a great humility and a broken heart and a contrite spirit. It depends upon you whether or not you are forgiven and when. It could be weeks, it could be years, it could be centuries before that happy day when you have the positive assurance that the Lord has forgiven you. That depends on your humility, your sincerity, your works, your attitude. What did you hear a whole lot of there? Yeah. Did you, what did you not hear anything of? 
Jesus. Jesus is not part of this at all. It's based on you. Yeah, there's grace. After all you can do. So I, I look at a quote like that, and I think, wait a minute. I may not have weeks, let alone years or centuries. Uh, Spencer Campbell was a big person, a big advocate on you had to do it in this life. It's chapter 1, this life is the time. He cites accurately from Alma chapter 34 that you have to do it in this life. If not, the devil doth sue you his, and you're in his power forever. So we have this idea that you have to do this, and it's not about what Jesus did on the cross. Uh, Robert C. Gay was a member of the Presidency of the Seventy, and the General Conference said, The Lord loves our righteousness, but asks of us continued repentance and submission. This is the exchange. It's like there's a deal being made here. This is the exchange the Savior is asking of us. Here's what he says you have to do. We are to give up all of our sins, big or small, for the Father's reward of eternal life, we are to forget self-justifying stories, excuses, rationalizations, defense mechanisms, procrastinations, judgmental thoughts, and doing things our way. We are to separate ourselves from all, on, uh, from all worldliness and take upon it the image of God in our countenances. How many Latter-day Saints think they've done this or are doing it? I don't meet anybody. They'll joke around. They'll have some fun with me. Last Saturday, I had this one man, and he was joking, I know, but he says, because I asked him if he was doing everything that Spencer Kimball said uh, that he was supposed to do in the miracle of forgiveness, a book I like to give away at these public gatherings. And, and he laughed. He says, yeah, I'm doing it all. So I opened up to page 25, and I said, well, it's 85 things that Spencer Kimball wrote there. And I said, well, let me, let me look at these things. Oh, um, arrogance, pride. And I started reading these. And his, it was girlfriend or wife, I'm not sure. She just started laughing. And the whole crowd, of, there were about 40 people around. They were all laughing. We had fun, you know, joking around. But, and then he kind of hung his head, and he was so glad the light turned green so he could cross the street and go to the gate. But, uh, I mean, they know they're not doing it. They might joke around with it, but they know that they've fallen short. They know that if they were to die right now, they can't accept the, uh, the promise of 1 John 5.13. 1 John 5.13 says we may know we have eternal life. Latter-day Saints don't know that. They hope, they try, they do their best. Admirable. Don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to criticize them for wanting to do the right thing. But if you're trying to do this on your own shoulders, good luck. And, if, you know, Jesus says in Matthew 7, there will be a lot of people who use the good card. Oh, I did many good things, right? We did many good things in your name. What does Jesus say? Good for you. Glad you could be like, like, come unto my kingdom. You did good. No, he says, I never knew you. Depart from me. This is serious business, guys. This life is very short. And, uh, and people are are going to eternal damnation. I mean, I'm not a hell and brimstone kind of preacher. I don't go on the street and do that. But at the same time, this is serious business. And this is why Bill and I have moved to Utah in the um, last year. So Bill moved in 2004, and I moved in 2010. And you're here, many of you from out of state. This is a mission field. There's so many good things that God can do. He quotes from Doctrine and Covenants, section 110. Hale sa quotes this. It says, Denying ourselves of ungodly behavior is the beginning of repentance, which brings a mighty change of heart until, and this is what it says in DMC 110, we have no more disposition to do evil. Listen to what Moroni 10.32 in the Book of Mormon says. Yea, come unto Christ and be perfected in him and deny yourselves of all ungodliness. And if ye shall deny yourselves of all ungodliness... And love God with all your might, mind, and strength. If you do those things, then is his grace sufficient for you, that by his grace ye may be perfect in Christ. And if by the grace of God ye are perfect in Christ, ye can in no wise deny the power of God. Notice, you have to do this if to be able to get to then. Then is his grace sufficient for you. See, as uh, Spencer Kimball said, salvation is not for the asking. Wow. It's, according to Christianity, it is. Uh, and, and DNC 5843, I am shocked how many times LDS leaders cite Moroni 1032 and DNC 58. They usually don't quote all of DNC 5843, but they quote, uh, this is the part that I think is damning. By this he may know if a man repenteth of his sins. How do you know if somebody's repented? Behold, he will confess them 
and forsake them. And if you go, uh, type that verse into our website, and you will see articles that we have written on this, because LDS leaders very clearly have taught that you have to forsake your sins in hope of being able to get the celestial kingdom. You have to stop sinning. In fact, Spencer Kimball in DNC 82.7 says that it's possible for all of your former sins to come back if you repeat the same sin. So we have to love our LDS friends because there's a high depression right here in Utah, and I think a lot of it has to do with the religion. They're trying their hardest, and they know they're not doing everything. They don't know where they're going to go when they die. They don't know God really loves them in their current state. And they need us to be forgiven of their sins. They need to be able to have a relationship with Jesus. Uh, we do this by being baptized and receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. What is water baptism? Well, it's required for remission of sins, beginning at the age of eight. Performed by immersion and valid only if administered by a Mormon male holding priesthood authority. And the gift of the Holy Ghost, that is conferred upon a person after baptism. They put their hands on a person and they are confirmed, it's called. And that's the fullness of blessing available to a member after water baptism, after the age of eight or whenever they get water baptized. And by the way, they don't do that at the temple. They do that at their local congregation, the chapels. Uh, the Holy Spirit remains with those who stay worthy, though he will draw when the commandments are not kept. Can you imagine having a God who you can't trust that he'll be with you if you're sinning? I mean, if you've sinned, and I'm not saying we should go out and sin. That's definitely not what I'm saying at all, because the Christian is justified by faith alone, but we're justified onto good works, which would be sanctification. We're, we're saved onto good works. And, and God wants us to have good works. Uh, very clearly, that's taught in the Bible as well. Inside Magazine says we believe we must be baptized and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost to be saved in the kingdom of heaven. Baptism also includes a sacred covenant, a promise, between Heavenly Father and the individual who is baptized. We covenant to keep His commandments, serve Him, and children upon ourselves the name of Jesus Christ. Then he goes on and says, laying on of hands by, holding, by those holding priesthood authority. Again, if you don't know much about Mormonism, you might read this and say, oh, I think that sounds Christian. What does it mean, laying on of hands? Well, it's the act of the priesthood leaders putting their hands on the head of a person to bestow a blessing. There's nothing wrong with blessing people. The Bible says in James we can do that. We can pray for the sick. Uh, there's certainly a laying on of hands. And the priesthood, they believe that males hold two divisions, what's called the Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthoods. And so at the age of 11, starting at the age of 11, they can have what's called the Aaronic priesthood, and there are offices that are part of that, including deacon and teacher. And then there's a, a Melchizedek priesthood that can be received at the age of 18. So when you see a male uh, missionary and he has the term, the, uh, the, the title elder in front of his name, that's an office, not like we would have elders. We're usually taking older men. They can have it at 18. It's an office in the church. The priesthood is, um, is important to them because they believe that's the authority they have received to be able to do, uh, to be able to have a restoration. Um, uh, this is what it says. Male members of the church may begin their priesthood service when they reach the age of 12. It's now 11. They just changed it a, a year or two ago. They begin by holding the Aaronic priesthood, and they later may qualify to have the Melchizedek priesthood conferred on them. At different stages in their lives, and as they prepare themselves to receive different responsibilities, they hold different uh, offices in the priesthood, such as deacon, teacher, or priest, and the Aaronic priesthood, or elder or high priest of the Melchizedek priesthood. In Christianity, we have what's called the royal priesthood. Peter talks about that. So we do male, female. Uh, there, there's not, it's not like an office in that sense, but the priesthood is given to all believers. But Jesus is the only one that held the Melchizedek priesthood, according to Hebrews. And the Aaronic priesthood, you had to be from the tribe of Levi or Aaron. And we don't have that priesthood in Christianity. Uh, then he goes on and he talks about, uh, he, he says, A Christian knows that throughout the ages, God's prophets have always testified of Jesus Christ. The same Jesus, accompanied by Heavenly Father, appeared to the prophet Joseph Smith in the year 1820 and restored the gospel and the organization of his original church. What is restoration? Restoration is the reestablishment of true gospel principles. According to Mormonism, Christianity died soon after the death of the apostles. 
When that happened, they don't know. But somewhere in there, in fact, most Latter-day Saints, if they know anything about the Council of Nicaea in 325, Constantine, they'll say that's where it took place. Always ask them, you need to know a little history for this, but uh, to ask them what they think happened at the Council of Nicaea. And I've heard everything from they established the Bible there, they created the Trinity, they come up with all kinds of things. No, it did, the Trinity wasn't established there, and they did not determine the canon. Rather, what they did is determine whether Jesus should be worshipped or not. Is he God, or is he just a man? And they determined, based on the scripture, that he was very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, one of our creeds says. And, uh, and so anyway, the restoration had to be restored because all the authority was lost because they didn't have any leaders called apostles, and it wasn't reestablished until Joseph Smith comes into the picture. Mark E. Peterson says this, we, Latter-day Saints, have that new revelation. We have a new prophet and new scriptures also, which added to the Bible now point the way. This new revelation brought with it the true understanding of the nature of God and our restoration of primitive Christianity. That restoration is Mormonism. It came about through the ministry of the prophet Joseph Smith, Jr. He saw God and communed with him even as did Moses. So Joseph Smith is hugely important in this religion. Uh, they don't worship Joseph Smith, but without Joseph Smith, this religion is nothing. Then uh, Hale says, restored the gospel and the organization of his original church. What is gospel? Gospel is all your doctrines, principles, laws, ordinances, and covenants necessary for a Mormon to receive exaltation. A little different than what we would mean, right, from what gospel is. Richard G. Scott, an apostle who died in 2015, said, Our Father's plan for salvation is this life with the opportunity of returning to him would be called the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he's not just talking about going to heaven like we would think, but uh, returning to him would be the idea of the celestial kingdom that you will also be able to have your own realm. I want to read this quote. This is the only person who's not a general authority, but she did actually say this at a general conference. Again, general conferences are very important. As I wrap this thing up here today, I want you to hear what she has to say because I appreciate what she said just five years ago at a general conference. She said, We claim that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the kingdom of God and the only true church on the earth. It is called the Church of Jesus Christ because he stands at the head. It is his church and all these things are possible because of his atoning sacrifice. We talked about atonement. We believe that these distinguishing features can be found in no other place or organization on this earth. You see what she just said? As good and sincere as other religions and churches are, none of them have the authority to provide the ordinances of salvation that are available in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Remember at the beginning I gave you a quote from Joseph S. Smith? A lot of Mormons aren't going to accept that because he's a dead prophet. They, I don't know if he's really true. I wish more Mormons were like this. Instead of wanting to say, we're Christians just like you, I wish they would just say, well, we're true and you're not. And I appreciate the honesty because she's saying it's found, the distinguishing features of the true gospel are found in no other organization or place on this earth. We're good and sincere, and that's great, but they don't have the authority. This is what Mormonism is teaching. She's exactly right. Okay? So this is, I think, a great quote comes from the May 2016 Ensign Magazine, and I appreciate her honesty. Just call a spade a spade. And that's what she has done. Uh, then he concludes this way, with these doctrines as the foundation of our faith, can there be any doubt or disputation that we as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints are Christian? Do you think that this is a Christian church based on the definitions we've given for all these terms? That's why it's important. Don't just accept somebody's Words at face value. We believe in Jesus. We believe in the gospel. We, you know, whatever, we, whatever they believe or they say they believe, what do you mean by that? Just choose one. Maybe choose salvation. Choose gospel. Choose whatever it is and understand that this is not the same as the gospel that's preached from the pulpit at this church. B.B. Warfield, Christian pastor. And, um, he, he was from the late 19th century, early 20th century, said this. If everything that is called Christianity in these days is Christianity, then there is no such thing as Christianity. 
a name applied indiscriminately to everything designates nothing. Words have a meaning. And I think it's, it's wrong for us to have friendships with Mormons and make them think that they're Christian just as we are. As nice as we can be, we can say, you know, there's something green in your teeth. Have you ever done that? You've eaten salad and you walk through the day and nobody said anything. And, and then you look in the mirror and you say, why didn't somebody say something? Because they don't want to be mean. I'd rather somebody be mean and tell me I have something green in my teeth and get that out so I don't embarrass myself the rest of the day. I'm going to call brass tacks. I'm going to say Christianity is a very important word. It's a historical word. And I, unfortunately, I just don't think Mormonism fits the bill. Uh, we do have a book table. We're going to take a break right now. And in the back, this book table, we have different books, uh, DVDs, um, some of the books uh, Bill and I have written are there. Mormonism 101 uh, is a book that kind of overviews uh, what Mormonism is versus uh, uh, Christianity. Answering Mormon's Questions deals with 38 of the most common questions. Like, this is chapter one we went through. And so uh, those two books are normally $38 together. Today they're 35 if you'd like to get that. I also wrote a teenage book, a simplified version of Mormonism 101, called Mormonism 101 for Teens. In Their Own Words is a book that is like an encyclopedia that Bill wrote. Put to, he didn't write it. He just compiled these different um, uh, quotes. And if that's something you're interested in. And finally, uh, sharing the good news with Mormons. I am writing a new book. It's going to come out next year. I'm very excited about it because, it, I don't know if you realize, but two out of three people who leave Mormonism are not going to Christianity or really any religion at all. Two out of three, only 10%, according to the statistics, go to evangelical Christianity. We're losing a lot of Mormons right now. And so this book is called Introducing Christianity to Mormons. Uh, I, I'm very excited about that book. Uh, and so um, uh, that will be coming out next fall. And uh, I'm hoping that will be a good resource for you to be able to learn how to speak about this Christianity because too many Latter-day Saints who are leaving are not considering this faith, and I think they should. Just because they are out of Mormonism doesn't mean that they should not, or that, that they should uh, uh, abandon God and a relationship with Jesus. It's possible to have a relationship with Jesus even if the church that they were in did not tell them the truth. So, uh, and, and we're planning, by the way, the temple is going to reopen for open house for about four weeks. We hope to come back next fall, and sometime in the fall, we're expecting next year, that will open up for four weeks. You'll have a chance to take tours, and we're going to be outside doing evangelism. Maybe some of you would like to be a part of that. So we're going to be uh, trying to do some things with that temple. And there's another temple, um, that uh, uh, Red Cliffs Temple, that is on the other side of St. George. You're getting a second temple which is a rare, really rare thing. Not many cities have two temples. You will have a second temple, and that will open in 2023. So we like to do evangelism out there. Lots of opportunities. You got a newsletter when you walked in. If you didn't, they're in the back. If you would like a free two-year subscription, go to the back, sign up on the paper there. You can get a free two-year subscription. We're going to take a short break, maybe five minutes, and then Bill's going to come up and give us the final hour. Okay? And then... Um, we'll be around afterward to answer questions. We can answer a few right now, too, in the back, if you'd like. 